Dear brothers and sisters, grace and peace are yours this day from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. This week's gospel lesson unfolds. We find ourselves in Jerusalem, and Jesus is teaching in the temple, and he is confronted by the chief priests and the elders, and they question him about his authority. And they do so for good reason. Now, our gospel lesson just plunks us down in the middle of the story, so a little background here. Since last week, when Pastor Dom was talking to us about uh, the workers in the vineyard, Jesus has been preaching and teaching on this idea of undeserved grace and love from God, and his focus remains the same this morning for us in our gospel lesson. But since last week and this week, Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem triumphantly on a carpet of palms. He has entered into the into the temple itself, and not only to teach, but he's also cast out the money changers, and he's caused no small amount of alarm throughout the community as a whole. They've gotten rather excited about his presence there. So the powers that be are a little concerned because they're in kind of a tenuous position, trying to keep the crowds happy and trying to keep the Roman occupying government from breathing down their necks. So they come to Jesus with this question, by whose authority do you do these things? And where does this authority come from? And Jesus, in good rabbinic tradition, comes back to them with another question about his own authority regarding John the Baptist. The chief priests and the elders, knowing that no matter how they answer this question, they're going to be in trouble with somebody. All right? So they answer the best they could. In modern language, they neither confirm nor deny what, what John had done. So they say, we don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you the answer to this question. So changing tactics, Jesus is still continuing to teach as he tells a story about two brothers. And if you know your scriptures, if you know your Bible stories, if you ever hear a story coming up to you that says something about two brothers, it's loaded with information. Think about the two brothers that we already know just from the top of our mind in scriptures. There's Cain and Abel. There's Jacob and Esau. There's Joseph and well, all his brothers. There's Moses and Aaron. And Jesus himself told many stories dealing with brothers. So from the get-go, we know this story is labored and loaded with meaning. What Jesus is doing here is letting those who are listening know that in no uncertain terms, the people in this story are them. Is that even grammatically correct? Well, you get my point. All right? So let's look at this story again. A man has two sons, and he asks both of them to go out in the vineyard to work, and the first responds rudely and bluntly and maybe a little bit rebellious. Maybe he's got a leather jacket on and a duck tail and just, no, Dad, I'm not, I don't think so. But later he changes his mind, and he goes out and he works. The second seems respectful. He probably has a nice clean haircut and doesn't cause any trouble, and Dad comes to him and says, I want you to go work out in the vineyard. And basically the son responds, your wish is my command, but he does nothing. Which of the two, asks Jesus, does the will of the Father? Duh, the priests say basically, the first. But this is one of those stories, while I don't remember the exact sermon my dad preached on it, I do remember him preaching on this, and I remember this gospel lesson. I remember where I was sitting in Christ Lutheran Church in Stoughton, Wisconsin, when this was done. I'm sitting right about where Wally is back there on that side. My mom was on the other side of me. And I remember having these words in this sermon run around in my head going, well, which son am I? Who am I in this story? On some levels, I'd like to say I was the first because I knew that's the way I often operated. I don't always want to do what God wants me to do. I don't even do what my own father wants me to do. But eventually, sometimes I get there. But I also knew I was the second, because sometimes I am eager to please, and I will say yes, having no intention actually to do anything about it. So I sat there and wanting to be the hero of my own story, which I think we frequently want to do, don't we? We want to be the good guys in our stories. So I thought, oh, I got an idea. I can take the best. I'll be the son that says yes and goes out into the vineyard and work. I was convincing myself I could be this kind of a guy. I had passion. I had feeling. And it lasted right up until I was asked to do the dishes after Sunday dinner. But that's the truth of it, isn't it? For all of us. 
Sometimes we are the first son. Sometimes we are the second son. Sometimes we think we've got it all together and we can get it all right, and we fail. We come to church and we sing and we pray and we pat ourselves on the back for not dozing off during pastor's sermon. As we walk out of the church doors, we're feeling pretty good about that day, about who we are and whose we are. We have received the supper. We are loved and adored and forgiven. But what happens on Monday morning? Do the prayers we pray, the confessions we utter, the pleas for forgiveness and mercy, do they follow us into the week? Do they change us in the way we live, in the way we act? and what we do in God's vineyard called the world. We seem, I think, to have this uncontrollable need as I look out on the world around us to divide the world into you and I, us and them, the unsaved and the saved, the sinners and the saints, the outsiders and the insiders. Maybe one reason we come to church is to be reassured that despite our occasional moral lapses, we're not really bad people. Certainly we're better than, well, we're better than them, whoever them happens to be, those folks who maybe don't come to church, those folks who may not be from the Midwest, those folks who may not be Lutheran, those folks who may be whatever they are. We are inside this morning, and they are outside, so we'll pray for them. But don't think church people are the only ones that play this game. I have seen enough in this world to know that the self-righteous folk in this world may not always be the folk in the church who are praying like the pompous Pharisee who prayed, God, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart that I'm so much better than everybody else. No. Today's self-righteous people may be more like those who don't come to church but stand outside and pray, God, if there really is a God, I may not be the best person in this world, but at least I'm better than those hypocrites who are in that church building. And really, if there's a good place for hypocrites to be, isn't there a better one than this place? I mean, honestly, all right? But one commentary I, I read called this section The Parable of the Two Imperfect Children. What a great title, and what a true title. I can tell you, though, that this first audience that Jesus was, was, was speaking to, and maybe just a few of us, know what is coming down the line at them. And when he says what's next, it can sting a little bit. He says, truly, I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes will go into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. Ouch! What do you think a good church-going person would respond to that? The truth is that these people were not bad people, the chief priests and the elders. They were actually the people you want to buy the house next door to you. They are the people you want your son or your daughter to marry into their family. They were decent people. They were good people. So when Jesus says that blatant sinners like tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God ahead of them, well, that seems to be just rude. So what was Jesus driving at here? Why was he being so mean? Well, he wasn't being mean. But what he was trying to do was to do something, and that was to wake these good people up. You see, we're often fixated on separating us versus them, winners versus losers, as a pastor, I heard once said, self-righteousness is and always will be the problem because we are constantly trying to divide ourselves where God is saying, you are all mine. Paul reminds of this in our first lesson from Philippians. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus in other words, live out your faith into this world for the sake of others. Sometimes, though, we hear the words and we have a hard time translating them into deeds, into action. Sometimes as Lutherans, we know that we are saved by faith and we're pretty much betting on that because we don't do much else. But there's this old Japanese legend that tells of a man who died and went to heaven. Beautiful place full of gardens and greenery and mansions. Everything was lovely, and he's getting the grand tour of the place, and, and suddenly they come upon this enormous building that is just goes on for miles. And for miles there are shelves in this building on all the walls and in between. They're just jam-packed, and all these shelves are lined and filled with piles of human ears. The heavenly guide explained that these are ears that belong to all the people on earth, who listened each week to the word of God, but never acted on God's teachings. 
Their worship never resulted in action. When these people died, therefore, the only, only their ears ended up in heaven. Now, while God loves their ears, and he certainly loves mine because they're cute and small, um, he wants all of us. And when I say he wants all of us, he wants us completely, and he wants all of us, rich or poor, tall or short. The first son in this parable represents all of us, sinners in, in, in name, and name your flavor of sin. You've got your own in your head. I'm sure you know what they are. Those people, us, the sins you commit, the sins you see other people committing, you know what these are. In our Faith 45 adult classes last week, we came upon a phrase from Martin Luther uh, that fits this context. And he wrote, be a sinner and sin boldly, which is where we like to leave it because we think it sounds kind of funny. But it continues. But believe and rejoice in Jesus Christ even more boldly. So first of all, when Luther says, be a sinner and sin boldly, it is far from an endorsement of bad behavior. No, too often we as Christians do not act on the grace given us for fear of making a mistake and in so sinning. It's sort of like a baseball player standing at the plate and refusing to swing at a good strike right down the pike. We are called to act. We are called to do Brothers Martin's advice is fear not. He wants us to go out in this world to do, not just to sit back and do nothing, or worse yet, sit back and judge others who try. If what you are doing in the Lord's name is good, then great. But if you've made a mistake, God in Christ forgives. The key is in the doing. Last week, this last week, Pastor Dom and I were down in, in Lake Geneva, not just soaking up the rays and enjoying things, but we were actually at a conference where uh, Pastor Mike Foss, the senior pastor of St. Mark's down in West Des Moines, was our primary speaker. He talked about how he encourages his staff and volunteers to make mistakes. Well, not actually make mistakes, I guess, but when they do goof things up, when things happen, when a mistake does occur, they respond with the word fascinating. Fascinating. Mistakes are fascinating because you can look at what happened and you can learn from what occurred so that you may end up doing what you need to do in the first place. So if someday, in the name of Jesus, you make a mistake in ministry around St. John or out in the community and you call me up and say, Pastor David, I have made a fascinating mistake. I will say, oh good. That, what can we learn from it? Or maybe I will ask, just how fascinating was it uh, first? My point is this. My point is repentance. My point is learning from our mistakes, returning to God, returning over and over again to God, which was John's message, which is Jesus' message for us, taking God's grace and forgiveness that is freely offered to us, and then leaning into God's promise for us. The key, key dear Lutherans, is to do, to live, to be God's very children in this world, we do this because of what Christ has done for us already. Our salvation is assured. We are free to care for others in Jesus' name and be Jesus for them. This is good news for us and for all of God's imperfect children because while Jesus doesn't answer the question in today's reading, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority, he will answer that question. And he will answer that question on a hill called Golgotha. This is the Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard, regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The answer as to authority is answered in an open an empty tomb that grants us life, forgiveness, and a future in Jesus' name. We are called through the waters of baptism into the vineyard where we find that we do not work alone, but we go with God for the sake of our neighbor and those who have yet to join us in the vineyard and the work of God's love for all. Amen. <laughs>